Hey, what's up, guys? This is Brendan with Evoke Bike. We've got an awesome interview with Tyler Williams of Legion of Los Angeles, where he talks about his days racing in Europe and the success and failure that he had there. He goes into talking about stress, race results, overtraining, why he linked up with Legion, what Legion is trying to do. There's a lot of lessons in here that we can all apply, though, to our own training and racing so that we can all try and get a little bit faster, find that 1% extra optimization. Tyler, thank you so much for coming on, man. We really appreciate all the L's that you dropped on us and look forward to racing someday soon. Guys, enjoy the interview. Yeah. Man, I really appreciate you sitting down and chatting for a little bit. Um, yeah. I don't know what Patrick had mentioned to you just besides our brief email of, we kind of started this series of reaching out to experienced cyclists. Um, you know, as we started our coaching business a couple of years ago, it really started on like a phone call of us talking about I, some random training topic. And I'm like, dude, we should record this. Like, I, I, we're talking about it. I feel like this is interesting. Maybe other people want to hear this. Yeah. And somebody like you that has so much race experience, you've forgotten more than most people have experienced yet or will ever. And so, <laughs> Just the little tangents and things that you're doing uh, is so valuable to so many people out there, especially the, you know, cat threes, fours and fives that are trying to cut their chops, upgrade and find their way through just the American racing scene. And then you have layered on top of that, all this international racing experience. Um, so really, I mean, this is just a conversation to sort of pick your brain a little bit, but really more understand your process as an athlete and a cyclist and whatever you can share and uh, Stephen Bassett kind of coined it in his like he's like can I go out on a tangent and like yeah like if something it pops in your brain that you think would be valuable for other people to hear please go off topic yeah. as you might find important but um you know we kind of and we'll kind of just maybe give some context of who you are as a person in cyclist run through a couple like process questions of how you approach things and then if there's anything you want to add and we'll kind of wrap it up from there if that sounds like a good uh trajectory sounds good to me cool man all right well the easiest question i always say is uh introduce yourself who is tyler williams so like so much background noise come in um <laughs> yeah so I'm tyler williams i've uh, been racing bikes for 12 years now um yeah i've done like it feels is weird because I think about it's like 12 years ago. It, it doesn't feel like it's been that long. And yet it does feel like I've been doing this forever. Um, and you're how old? I'm 26. Okay. Yeah. 26. Cool. Uh, yeah. 26. I'm a new dad. Um, so I'm adjusting to trying to still be an athlete while being a dad. Um, yeah. I mean, like, and yeah, I've raced in Europe, I raced in Europe for, eight plus years I think and then uh, now I'm with Legion of Los Angeles and kind of in like a rider slash leadership within the team role so again adjusting to like a new phase of my career but it's awesome I'm, I'm enjoying it and it keeps me motivated that's awesome that's a great intro what's uh so actually as I was looking through some old results Tyler's first team was actually team booty if you look that up on road results I don't know if you just put that in as a joke but if you look it up really your no. first your first cat five is team booty and I was like interesting <laughs> this yeah. little, little junior coming in with a phone <laughs> race name that's funny yeah. yeah I didn't know that so, and then uh, just so, so people kind of know where you're coming from 2013 to 2015 BMC Devo, then moved yeah. to action Hoggins Berman for 2016, 2017 and 18 was Israel cycling Academy. And then was it the end of 2019 you linked up with Legion? Yeah. Then, cool. So I, I, after cycling Academy, I didn't have a ride. Um, so I actually went to EMT school and started working on ambulance and was going to become a firefighter and then in but i was like i was still training quite a bit like definitely backed it down a hair and was a little less serious about it but i was still i, I enjoyed riding so much and racing still so and i hadn't done any like local northern california racing and since i was a junior so i was like kind of like enjoying like riding on that scene again um and then in july i did boise twilight was my first race with uh team uh, with legion i did redlands with team california 
Uh, and then I then I did Boise Twilight with Legion, and that's when that whole thing kicked off in July. And then I did a few. I only did two guest rides that year. I did uh, Boise and San Rafael, mm-hmm. and then um, just finished out the the local season riding for Legion. And then 20, 2020 was my first full full time year. Cool. So take us through. I mean, being twenty six, you've been racing since you're fourteen. Then how did you get into this? Like, and how, when did you go over to Europe for the first time were you living over there full time do you have family there was it only racing what was kind of going on with that yeah so I got into cycling my first memory of cycling was watching Lance's last tour so 2005 um and then I kind of like started just like riding like my starter level mountain bike around a bunch and uh like I would like watch the tour stage and then go ride and (laughs) I mean I, I felt like I was doing like mountains at the time and in reality it was like two minute hills but i was like oh, doing mountain stage. i'm crushing this yeah yeah no like so like if i would like if it was a mountain stage in the tour i would go and kind of do like the hilliest loop i could do uh and i did that for some years until i finally got a road bike in 2009 um at the time i was racing racing cars so i was racing go-karts and stuff like that and that was like my career path until that until i got a bike and then that was the end of it um I, uh, so I got a bike 2009 and then started kind of, I think I just got my cap for that first year. Um, cause I was still kind of racing cars and doing both. And then I had to make a decision basically, cause you just can't do two things well. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so then I decided to focus on cycling and then I joined team Swift in 2011, which was my 17 year old racing age year. Okay. And then that was the year that kind of everything took off. So then I was, a, I think I was already a three when I joined. Um, but then I started off the season pretty hot. I won a few of the bigger junior races in Northern California. And then I won the road race at Valley of the Sun, which was kind of like a selection for the national team. Okay. Um, so once I won that, uh, then I got the, the email to go do the spring block, the first spring block of racing with uh, the national team when they were based in Belgium. Um, and yeah, went over and just got absolutely just destroyed. I got, I don't even know, looking back, I know why they brought me back because I'm just like stubbornly determined, but in like willing to do whatever I need to do to, to be better. But man, I sucked. I got crushed. Um, mind that's you, that's a common did. thread though, right? Like yeah, that. And, like, yeah. Mind you, we all did. It was not, I think like, it's funny. I think like kids now when they go over, it seems like they're they're adapting quicker to the racing style and so i'm just going to go ahead and say my generation took takes credit for for you know breaking down those barriers because man we used to go over there and just it was like you weren't even expected to get a result until your second or third trip Mm -hmm. um and yeah so i went over for like two and a half weeks got smacked uh came home and then and what was the calibration for that like when you left were you like I'm good here in the States. Like I'm going to go rip this. Or were you expecting, like, I've heard this is hard. Yeah. Maybe I think you can't, I, maybe, it was maybe more you don't have a, that memory or. I don't know. I think I didn't really know what to expect. Cause I was still so inexperienced and like, mind you, like none of my family comes from any sort of sporting background or cycling or anything like that. So I was going over there. I knew it was going to be hard. I yeah. knew that, like, this is like, best guys in the world mind you we were doing like Kermes trips like it wasn't like anything super crazy um for an 18 year old 17 year old that's still pretty crazy it was crazy like yeah it was it was a huge adjustment um I did not know what I was getting into and then that's so cool I went back so then I did tour a bit of me with the national team and then I did another trip that year in the fall and it was kind of that second trip where I started to kind of get my get my feet under me and like was able to like properly race the races okay um and i think i think that that was when i kind of started to figure out like just i feel like there was a big jump that summer um so then i went back again in 2012 and i had mono that like whole winter almost Ooh. and then i so i missed actually my first spring walk racing which would was like kind of that was a that was tough tough thing to navigate because like it's it's silly but like i'm sitting there i'm 17 going in like you know i'm like junior junior in high school and i'm like i was gonna oh, ask you so you're, 
school traveling while you're away? Yeah, I did that first year. And then I started doing like a, like a hybrid school that the second, my second year of juniors, because okay. it was just, it was not gonna, it wasn't gonna work. Yeah. Sorry, um, I didn't mean to derail you there on the monitor. No, no, all good. Yeah, no, it's important. I mean, like I had to, I, I had so to, like, much going on at that age. At, just... at, I was, I mean, cause like my birthday's in November. So really like my 17 year old year, I was 16 and my 18 year old year, I was 17. Okay. Uh, so yeah, like I, I had mono then I didn't get to start really racing it took me I had mono like it wasn't like the worst but it was pretty serious like I was pretty down for a while um got back going though in like around April and was racing my first race was like sea otter and I was like okay and then I went straight back to Europe and luckily I went there with like some good form and we I did well like I but I won the green jersey in Georgia Pays Vode which is like a fairly big junior race in Switzerland um had some like just like solid I was like really consistent and solid um and that kind of it's funny because when I had mono I was like my career's over like I'm not I'm losing everything I'm not going to get a good 23 <laughs> team I remember it was the end of the world and and then you know I was able to just like hit the ground running in, in like May and then I still had like a couple of teams I had um live strong it was at the time it was live strong still and okay. uh and then BMC was starting their, their uh, U23 team. And I had, like, some BMC connections through Team Swift and in Santa Rosa because that's where they were based. So I already – I had, like, my connections there. Um, so, yeah, that was, that was like, the last time of my career that I actually had choices as far as teams went. Um, <clears throat> and I had, like, multiple teams offering me contracts, which was – yeah, it was crazy. But then, Hey, man, it's, it's cool to at least be in that position at least once, even if it was – Oh, yeah. Ago, no, man. trust me, I, I didn't – I took it for granted at the time. Well, because even to give context for people that – there are adults that are going to watch this that have never been to Europe. And I remember my sister went abroad a couple times. And so when I was a freshman in high school, not racing – I didn't ride bicycles then. Went over to visit her, and I got off the plane in Paris, and I was like, whoa, this is different. And yeah. so be your age, going to race, doing, dealing with all this other stuff like that, it's – yeah, it's awesome. It so, was – yeah, it was always like – I don't think it, and that part never got really easier either because it was always like, it, I never really had like a routine. It was almost changing every year because like the whole environment would change you within a team or maybe the BMC years were kind of the most consistent because we'd kind of do the camps in the same places. But yeah, it was always like pretty wild. That's interesting because Stephen Bassett made the whole comment of his biggest thing when he's abroad is trying to build his dojo, build his support system. So exactly what you're saying, like you didn't have, everything was changing so often. You didn't get to just get like dig in and be like, okay, this is my setup. This is my camp. This is my same crew. Da 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 da. That's interesting yeah. to hear that come up again. So you end up with BMC and, uh, I, I know you had, what, what do you, you, you had a huge result over there. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> so again, first year of BMC, I got basically smacked. Um, we, I guess like the jump from juniors to U23s is huge. And I was definitely not like an early, for sure, not an early bloomer as far as like, you know, results or like power and everything came. Like mm -hmm. I was on the, I was like a littler guy for a while. Um, is that jump similar to when someone goes from like cat three to cat one, two, yeah. and it's just like, things are yeah. faster. Things are exactly the Got races it. are longer. Um, my first U23 race was 200 K in the snow oh, in Belgium. Yeah. <laughs> that was my first race. And, and then I broke my collarbone twice that year. Actually, I broke it in June at Dairyland. I came back to do tour of America's Dairyland before nationals, broke my collarbone there. And then I broke my collarbone again at toward 11 year. Um, and yeah, so that whole like 2013 was a bit of a wash. It was a lot of learning. Mm -hmm. And like, I mean, it was like, it was successful. I think like for a first year U23 to make the toward 11 year team was kind of like a goal for me. That's, you know, U23 Tour de France. It's big, mm -hmm. big event and yeah. prestigious. And it was cool. It was cool to do. Uh, it was just unfortunate. I was doing it two like that race started two months after my collarbone broke. Wow. Um, cause it was like two months to the day that I rebroke it. Mm. Uh, so it was like, I was like kind of pushing the limit there a bit with just the recovery and doing it too fast. Then yeah, 2014, we, I just had a really good winter and that kind of like, I think I, I just like, again, like 
because there was some consistency, I think that that was made, one of the main things was um, I got to just build on what I had done in 2013. Because, yeah, I had a big result. I was second in Roubaix. Um, second in Roubaix, everybody. I hope you will yeah. hear that. That's crazy, dude. Congratulations. Yeah, so second later, in congratulations. Roubaix. That's amazing. Yeah. No, it was, and let me just say, for sure, the coolest thing I ever did in my life. Like, it okay. was awesome. So is that the uh, result you're most proud of? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. That was, it was Look at the fun. smile. I love that. <laughs> yeah, no, that was just, that, there was a, that whole, I don't know. It was like an out-of-body experience that, that whole day. There was like a different Tyler that was racing. But because I was like, I attacked like 60K to go out of the breakaway to like, and then that was what like the final move came down to. Wow. was me and, and Mike Tennyson and one of my teammates. And then Mike Tennyson, who won the yellow jersey of the Tour de France last year. Like, so he, he on, uh, he was a cyclocross world champion at the time. Okay. And on car four to Larbra, he just, he just put the hammer down and was riding in the, in the gutter and just went through. I was like hanging like by a thread. And then we made a turn and he just sent the turn like way fast and opened up like three bike lanes. And that was it. I couldn't close it. Wow. Um, yeah. You, if you look through that results sheet, it is like hit squad of yeah. hair. It is... I was always real good at riding cobbles. Um, that was something that came natural to me. So I, and like that race, I'd never done Roubaix before. We didn't do junior Roubaix when I was a junior. Um, so I didn't really know what I was getting into, which was probably a good thing. Cause it was just like, kind of like, ignorance is bliss and I just went and was in the breakaway and the breakaway is the best place to be at Rubay, like hands down um and yeah I just I just rode hard as long as I could for four hours and four and a half hours awesome. was. yeah um but I was also good like the rest of that year like well before you get into that when you said you had a good winter what do you classify as a good winter what do you think were some check boxes that like you were like okay I nailed those cross those t's yeah it was it was we had like a, I did a grand tour of training camps, like in that winter, like we had, um, a BMC camp that was like all the North American world tour pros, plus okay. all the North American de development guys. We did that it was like 10 days. And then I went from there, had like a week off and then went to the national team training camp, which was in uh, Chula Vista at the, uh, OTC there. And that was not like 10 days. And then I won a race that was like kind of like the opening, uh, SoCal race. Okay. um that like isn't suited to me it was like really hilly and but I was just riding well and I was like pretty like lean and just I was just in good shape mm -hmm. uh, and then went from there to the European BMC training camp and then I think that that like set like just a big foundation for me and I started the season okay but I'm trying to remember I think we did tour to Normandy and that race is it's like a week-long race in France that is just frozen it was mm -hmm. so cold and i was like broken at the end of that race like <laughs> i had like tendonitis in every mm. itis possible after that race like i was ruined but i think and then i like tried to do like another race after that and that was like kind of end of my spring block was just i was broken but it just i beat myself down so much that when i came back for Roubaix, i was like just a more robust and like strong mm -hmm. athlete They've talked and, about like biological durability on some like is the term they've thrown around on Velo News before. And I think that yeah. like, are you a big volume guy? No, okay. I'm not. I'm not. But I think that was, it was just like the amount, that was like a big block for me though. Cause every day of that race was like around like 180, 200 K and really hard. And mm -hmm. I think that that just, even though I like it tanked my whole winter um, because I mean, I was never, I was like, kind of more on and off sick from that race onward hmm. and, but then I went home and like kind of was able to regroup and then I just came out like really strong the whole rest of that year like I was just rock solid um so yeah I was just like in hindsight I can look back and all these things and like oh that was like a that was like a turning point for me but at the time I was super stressed out because I was still bad all spring and all the races I actually cared about and then like, I, I, I was like, I should have just taken that as like a, all right, like I put in this big load and now I'm just going to benefit from the rest of the year. But I was never like calm enough to ever do that. It's hard to see the forest sometimes when you're in. The, yeah, it was hanging it out. Yeah. And you're just like, you're just like, feel like you're drowning over there the whole time too. So it's never like good enough. Even at, like after Roubaix, like 
that was huge for me. And then I'm trying to remember, I think I want to say I was like pretty good at nationals also that year. And yeah, it was good. I was like fourth in the TT and, and stuff like that. And uh, I was like, I was just like real solid, but yeah, anyway, it was, it was a good year for me, but then the next year it kind of all fell apart again in 2015 because I had a really bad injury in April and that kind of derailed my whole season. And then again, with the environment, like the management of the team changed. Um, and that was just not basically the team that I had re-signed for, for 2015 was no longer the same people I was going to be racing under and okay. the directors were different. So then the environment was changed the atmosphere changed. I had a bad injury. I was kind of on the back foot. Um, and I was, I just kind of struggled that whole year, to be honest. It was like probably the hardest year of my career, I'd say was that year. Cause I remember that was the year we had worlds in Richmond and, um, yeah, it was like, I broke myself just to make that team. Like I was pushing so hard on like with nothing in the tank. And I remember like I, I did the race and like, I helped the team as much as I could. And then I finished the race and like second coolest experience of my life was doing world championships in, in Europe mm -hmm. or in, in Richmond. Mm -hmm. um, but then like, that was the end. I was, I was like broken after that. I, I like, I was the most burnt down on cycling I was ever in my life. So do you think it was too much or do you think taking it to that limit was necessary to perform at that level? That was too much. That was my where I went, I went over. Um, and I think, I think I heaped so I heap so much pressure onto myself, um, especially, especially back then that, yeah, it was just, I was just like, I was going, I was pushing way too hard and, and caring too much and trying to control too much. And mm -hmm. so that was when I changed to action was I needed a different atmosphere. And, that and do you, do you see these external stresses of like the change of the environment, like just a lot of other things going on besides the racing and trying to be an athlete have probably such an effect on the athlete's performance? Um, sometimes things you can't control. And then if you're, as you're saying, you're trying to control them, like, would you agree? Like uh, when things in life are chaotic, you're probably not going to race as well as when you can confine this, like things are good. Like I feel mm -hmm. good. Like it kind of goes into the mental aspect, but it's also just like, you hear people talk about like stress is bad, stress is bad. But I think as we're trying to be, well, I'm more adult athlete. It's like, oh yeah, there's things going on for work or family stress. Like people will message me and they're like, I had a horrible day. Da, 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 da. I'm like, well, that's probably why you performed horribly. It's just, there's too yeah. much. So to that point, <clears throat> I can, I can tell you that when I went from, so, I mean, the rest of my story is like, yeah, I went to action, went to cycling Academy, did two years there, did not get resigned. And then there was a pretty bad rider market and I had no job in 2019. Mm -hmm. And then, but I still trained that whole year. Um, and I found that I was stronger. I had gotten significantly stronger from, two, from 2018 to 2019 and 2019 to 2020. And one of the things that I think made a huge difference there was the amount of stress that was no longer in my life from trying to race in Europe at that level um, and always be worried about having a job and am I performing well enough? And, you know, you're just right on that razor's edge. I was, I was always fighting being sick. I was sick six times a year, probably. Wow. I've been sick once in the last two years. Mm -hmm. And it was, I think it's okay. Maybe it's a little bit less traveling for sure, but I stopped fighting, trying to make my body smaller than it wanted to be mm. trying to, you know, not eat or, or going trying to do as many races as I possibly could because I thought that was going to make the team happy or all these dumb things that I like cared about and put so much energy into that were just in the end and all the background like stress and noise that was always going on too like once they, that went out of my life my performance as an athlete has just continued to go up and I'm a little older um and I think that that's helped as well but that has been really interesting, I think, to like think about and and look into is just like how much I improved from 24 to 26, especially once all that stress went away. I mean, it's like 10% improvement on numbers, like across the board from my threat, like from a threshold and aerobic power to a sprint and anaerobic power, like wow. 10%. Like it was yeah. huge. 
for like maybe going up like two kilograms. Like I didn't go up much in weight, but I just let my body be at like a happier place. So I was like always fighting to be like 73 kilos, 70. I got down to 72 for a little bit. And it was like working for me. I could do it for a bit, but I couldn't maintain that. Mm-hmm. And now I probably run around 75, 75 and a half, 76. And that is just my body is so much happier and healthier and, and, and consistent. What do you see as some signs that helped you find that? Because this is a huge topic that so many athletes struggle yeah. with. And I'm more in the camp. I mean, I'm a big dude. So for me, I'm in a different standpoint of like, I'm like, okay, do I race at 187 or 182? And I was like, when I first started racing, I was like, I got to be as lean as possible, as small as possible. Like yeah. I want to be able to get over these climbs with people. I was 177 and it just was I consistency. I would, I would have some good days, but my bad days were bad. And I was like, Hmm, I put on a couple extra pounds and I'm still pretty consistent. And I have more of that overdrive. That seems more important to me. Yeah. What are some things that helped you get in tune with this when you're like, this is where I'm supposed to be. It was kind of random that I found it. Um, because I just like one thing when I stopped being like, pro conti and and really caring i was just like well i'm done with like this like being hungry all the time kind of thing mm-hmm. um and or just like analyzing my body to the extreme like i just, just like still probably had some issues with that but definitely like took it down a few notches and just was like look i'll just be like you know whatever like it doesn't matter and i was probably like a little heavier than i needed to be that whole 2019 year because I just wasn't training and I was working and I was doing school and whatever. Um, but I found my power numbers had gone up and I was like, huh, that's interesting. Like, okay, I have some more muscle and stuff like that. But then when I started, especially like that whole, the back half of 2019, when I was like, okay, I'm going to race for Legion in 2020. So I'm going to like be professional again and then like take it seriously. I found my numbers were just going sky, like through the roof from where I was doing my best numbers consistently like almost whenever I wanted mm-hmm. and <clears throat> unfortunately in 2020 like I just like we didn't get a race so I never got to show it but mm-hmm. I spent ma- basically all of last year I hit the start of the year like okay but probably still more in like my best 2018 shape okay but then I spent time like refining that like process for myself like we talked about process it was like that refining that process of okay like where do where does my body need to be and like how much training load does it really need to be able to perform and what kind of training does it need because like one thing that cracked me was I didn't I I love riding hard but I was kind of like done doing like super specific intervals all the time like I'll do it like now and again but I find that like I ride hard enough that I don't need to sit there and just hit lap with my car Mm-hmm. And I don't need to do these 30 hour weeks all the time. It's um, a lot. Yeah, it is a lot for like, a, especially for a normal person, that's a ton. And I was never like, I should, I say 30 hour weeks. I never did that. I did like 26 hour weeks or 28 hour weeks. A lot or, of riding. Yeah. Like, and I did like a lot of, a lot of that. Um, so are you doing then, like 15 now? No, I still do like 20. I like okay. 20. Okay. My, I love so that you're like, found, I'm not high volume, but I ride 20 hours a week. I find, I found, so last year, um, I found that like my body likes between 19 and 23 hours. Mm-hmm. Um, to be fair, last year, I rode the most hours and kilometers of my entire life in one year last year. So, because wow. it was, but I was just so consistent right. because I was healthy. I was never sick. Um, and it's I could so just, good to hear because yeah. I was like at that 76 kilo range. And I knew like, if I really needed to raise, like I would drop a kilo and be a little bit faster uphill and not harm anything. But it, but I was just so much more consistent and just like healthy at that, just a little bit heavier weight, but I wasn't going slower uphill. So say like, for instance, in 2018, my threshold was probably like 380 or something. But then like last year I was whacking out like a 20 minute test at like 440 or 4 30 and and then i but i could do it the next day and then i could do it the next day it didn't matter it wasn't like this big peak i could just do that like consistently and my five minute power was where i think i saw the most improvement because i went from being able to do like 5 10 to 5 60 and we were like having like a big strava battle around here with all the five minute climbs and i could just do that power on every climb 
whenever I just like could mentally get myself up for it kind of thing. Cause it still yeah. hurts. But um, I just found that it was just like so much more consistent and I could recover and I could do it the next day. And um, that was like, yeah, that's been, that's been huge for me. And I would love to race again because like, I think I've learned a lot in the last two years of that, that I haven't necessarily gotten to show on, on, on an outside race yet. Um, so my last question, and then we'll move on from body weight, but let's boil this down for the cat fours and fives who are just starting. I've always tried, uh, let's try and give one tip for someone who's super new to this. I've always been, you know, I'll get an email from somebody, Hey, my weight, you know, I, I carb up for this ride and then I like weigh more and I'm like, okay, so that's water weight. So my one basic tip for people, I'm like, don't always follow the, the weight on the scale, follow, get a body fat scale and follow your body fat percentage try to bring that down but don't hyper focus every morning on your pounds especially if you're a bigger rider to begin with you're going to drive yourself nuts mm -hmm. and just trying to help people like not ride this insanity wave what would you maybe say as a basic like nutrition or body composition tip that you've learned that maybe you could pass on that's something easy for a newer listener to follow with i mean i i i go off of I forget. I saw, I read it in some book of some, I don't know, it was like Michael Berry or somebody, one of the okay. old guys, but he would just go off the, the mirror. It's a great and, one. And I think the mirror is great. Like, you yes. know where, because at the end of the day, like if I look at that number on the scale and unfortunately Zwift has ruined this little bliss for me. Of not up, yeah. the scale, uh, Cause now I have to get on it again, which I hate. <laughs> um, but look, if I look in the mirror and I look lean and I feel good, then all I care about is how many watts I'm producing. There because at the end of the day, like watts, the more watts you can do, the better. Unless you're climbing the Alps, dude, having more watts in, in, your, in your back pocket is always, always, always going to be better. Whether it's in the first hour or in the last hour, whoever's doing the most watts is probably going to be winning or yeah. up. People think I'm going to be, I'm like paying people to say certain lines because I try to preach this to people. And I've got a guy right now who's like, I need to work on watts per kg. He does whiff, so it's important. Yeah. But I'm like, dude, you need power. You need yeah. watts. That's even what... on Zwift, though. If you, we can get into Zwift, but <laughs> the watts per kg matter only going uphill. But man, the rest of the time, you just want to have again. You just want to have a lot of watts. Yeah. When did you do drifting? Uh, like a year ago. Okay. What got you into that? just uh, racing we had some really wet winters and i was like oh i'm gonna i'm gonna i want to get swift finally so i bought a trainer and then yeah who would have thought i'd just be like an esports pro these days but that's what that evolved into really quickly um yeah it was it was just like i i mean it was already like kind of like a pretty popular thing and i just was like oh, i'm gonna give this a try and and i loved it like from the get-go because the quality of like the workout that you get from doing a race like any random race on there will give you like a full on like outside race simulation, like power wise. It's awesome. Um, races are hard as hell. Every race, no matter what, like random one you pick on any day, you can make it really hard. Mm -hmm. Which I loved. I love that. So do you use, has now that you're, you are on team USA, um, and you're racing there do you use the races as one training session or are you training anything specifically for the zwift races or how, and has anything changed in training now that you might be seeing real racing coming along so kind of a lot of questions at once yeah. but basically how does zwift fit into your training and racing? yeah so originally so last year it it became something to like like fulfill the competitive sure I keep like that competitive part of my brain going mm -hmm. um because i was getting like especially in the bigger swift races and stuff like that like we did that like virtual joe martin and virtual redlands and i got was getting the smoked and then i was like well i'm better than this like but then you have to like figure out how the game works and figure out mm -hmm. like because it's so much of learning that but also you do have to i did have to adjust my engine a bit and it, and i really do credit it for building my my threshold power up because i think that it's just forced me to just have be able to just do like 40 minutes at like a high threshold power and then do an effort off of that. Again, I really want to do outside racing because I think that all of those skills that Zwift has brought me, while it doesn't help you go around the corner, I think that that's never been my issue. My issue 
it addressed a lot of my weaknesses and I had to like overcome them um, in order to be good at Swift because I was like competitive and I was like, well, I'm going to figure this out. So yeah. then I was semi able to do that. I mean, I'm still learning heaps every time I do a Zwift race. And like when we did the, the worlds and I was on the calls with like the guys who've been in Zwift for like, since the beginning almost i was like well you guys know so much about this i'm just like <laughs> sitting here i'm a trainer and you guys have like algorithms for how it works it's uh, crazy it's yeah. really it's, it's i mean it's a, it's a whole different world and it's a whole new discipline of cycling but um yeah i mean i it it fits in i mean now yeah it's it's what we're doing as a racing legion is one of the main partner is zwift so mm -hmm. it's important to our team to be good at zwift as well um and yeah, I mean, it will continue to be a part of what I do to prepare for outside racing because there is nothing as hard as, as there is no outside race that is as hard as a Swift race. Wow. That's a yeah, huge statement. Sure. No, it is. It's hundred percent true. Like the numbers I do on Swift will, if I could do that, at the, even like midway through a race in an outside race, it's going to, you will make any front group. It, it makes me so I've been on Zwift. I've never I've lived in like I'm, I'm in small places and I have, uh, you know, a bunch of excuses as to why I never had a good Zwift setup. So I was doing it on like a computer under a porta cache in the winter in Memphis outside and I was getting draw. I don't think I've finished one Zwift race. And one of the guys on the evoke team was like, dude, you're using the power up at the wrong time. I'm like, wait, what, yeah. what am I supposed to see? <laughs> He's like, yeah. And so then it was like spring came and off I went and I sent my trainer to somebody else who would use it. And it definitely has me curious because Patrick Wally is like putting up some amazing numbers that he's never hit before and it's Zwift and there's plenty of riders that are having this. I think it's great that it's, I mean, I remember being in the basement one winter, it was probably like my sixth winter of cycling and I was just so burnt of like, okay, I was in upstate New York. So it was maybe four or five months of snow, you might see the outside every other weekend. And I was just like, all right, you know, I'm just going to do like four by 10 threshold. Cause I just don't care. I was so toast from like trying yeah. to train and I was only cat one. I was my career. And it was like, this, yeah, is, sure. this is losing the fun aspect of it. Um, so what do you think? What's your like number one goal? If you feel like sharing it as a cyclist these days with Zwift, you're now with Legion where, and you had kind of mentioned you're on this team as more of like a role of experienced cyclists, probably trying to help mentor some other people, maybe newer ones that are now on a pro team with Legion going pro. What's mm -hmm. kind of your, what are you trying to do? Well, I'm trying to race outside at some point that is yeah, man, okay. i miss that a lot um yeah. i do have so i i have a lot of experience but very little of it is on the american scene um so i really believe in in justin's vision as far as helping build up american cycling because when i was first getting into the sport was when there was like a really healthy continental scene still there was tour of georgia and california was in february and way better and there's utah was there and there was a lot of like just a really tour of missouri mm -hmm. so much cool stuff and like guys were making good livings racing in the u.s and i would love to be a part of bringing that back to what in, in into america i think that that we should have a good healthy cycling sport now it doesn't necessarily need to i think like the main problem is we try to make it europe and it's just not Mm -hmm. um so we need to find our own way of doing the sport and make it healthy and sustainable in the u.s uh so i care about really trying to help legion be the like the beginning of that mm -hmm. um i have like personal ambition is yeah i mean i want to i want to race and i want to try to win and help the team win um that's why i, I do it because i'm competitive and i enjoy it and i'm have personal challenges and i don't necessarily have like one race that i like care about like oh, i'm targeting this one yeah. because i mean at the end of the day like i want to try to help the team win or win every race i'm going to um and and i'm just looking forward to seeing implementing these like new things that i've learned in the last two years when i've just been sitting here experimenting and not at actual races sure um and actually getting to to use that and then yeah like i have like a kind of unique role within the team where I'm like kind of like almost management but also a rider so then it's like like yeah like I'm like one of the voices of like of like leadership so I enjoy enjoy like you know 
giving back my experience for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I still work with the junior team that I was on um, when awesome. I was junior. I work with them here whenever, you know, you can gather and stuff like that. So I enjoy like giving back that experience because man, like I think that if I had had a little more of that, I think it would have made a big difference in my career as well with just like the drowning of going up, feeling like you're going over to Europe and just struggling the whole time. Um, yeah. Well, man, it's in this, in this right here, the way you're giving back right now to people that I think it's easy to forget. I made a comment to somebody of, uh, I was talking to somebody about trying something new. It's actually a buddy of mine who's not a cyclist. He's looking for, he's, you know, I'm almost 40 and he's working and he makes money. And he's like, I don't know what my identity is outside of this. And I was like, dude, let me give you, and he, go, he goes, you found cycling. And I said, but you know what? I went to the first bike race. I was in basketball shorts. I totally did not fit in. It felt horrible. It was super awkward. And I think we all like people that have been in the sport for a long time, we forget how weird it was because we're going to a sport that it's not common in the U S it's not like you just, everybody's talking about cycling and it's like this common thing, but we have athletes that fall in love with it when they're 30, 35, 40, and they're trying to find their entryway in, but like their buddy next door doesn't ride. They're trying to like find connections of people to like meet and share this passion with. And so I think it's cool for you guys to want to not only grow the sport at like a professional level where riders can actually race and live, but then it helps it become more common for Joey, who's just trying to like figure out the cycling scene. Yeah. Our um, sport needs to be more, more relatable, less elitist, like, totally. um, like totally. I, we're all doing the same thing. Like, I don't care how fast or slow you're going. Like everyone's it's like such a cliche thing to say. Like, everyone puts their, their bibs on the same way. Or whatever. <laughs> I just said that it's, the other day. Damn it. <laughs> it totally is. Like it's, I mean, yes, we go faster or slower or some are better or worse, but I mean, I think it's sad that our sport is, it seems like it's structured to be like, you're a professional or you shouldn't do it. Um, it's like the one sport that people can do forever. Yes. And I think it, like, I personally find it sad that like so many of the guys that I started racing with as juniors, I'm not that old. None you're, of them. You're ride. not old at all, dude. Yeah. Well, don't, <laughs> don't tell like my team because man, they just think I'm a grandpa. It's, it's like, you're dad. You know, like, well, how old, hair. but like, how old's uh, Justin and Corey? Corey's a year older than me and Justin's yeah. 30. Yeah. But they, yeah. they don't tell them that. Okay. Um, <laughs> no. So like they, uh, I just think it's sad like so many of these guys like if you they don't make it pro and then they just they just get chewed up and spat out of the sport and like I think cycling has a hard time like ret they'll, like they'll get someone in and, and it someone will find that addiction because it's so addictive like and they'll find it but then they'll burn out super quickly and then yeah they, they never buy a bike again they stop riding they don't follow the sport anymore and like we need to we need to I think get it to where it's like something that it should feel inclusive it should feel yeah i mean there's there should be tears to it absolutely like if you're one of the best in the country or whatever like that should that should mean something but it doesn't mean that it should like just absolutely discourage anyone else from ever picking up a bike again which is the cool thing going back to zwift zwift is awesome because you can at any point hop in a race with some professional and you're like all right i'm gonna see what what's up with this and it's like mm -hmm. you know like you, you might beat them you might get totally sm smoked like or vice versa like you have guys like me who got on Zwift and just absolutely got just their butts handed to them for the first like four months till they figured it out because like the, that challenge is what people enjoy about cycling and so I think it should just be I don't know I would tangent but like it's just like kind of like I feel like our sport it heaps so much pressure onto someone to be like great instead of just like enjoying the challenge of it yes. and enjoying like being part of like a cool, com like a cool community. And we need to make our community cooler. Uh, like bottom line is like, it should not be just like, this is like a super elitist like thing that like, well, oh, you don't, you don't like wear white socks, white shoes. Like, what are you doing? Like, come on. No, like, yeah. I <laughs> like, love it, it, dude. Yeah. So anyway, I mean, I've done it at, high level i've done it now like conti level i was a freaking amateur in 2019 i was just a normal cat one guy like i mean i've done i like, kind of been there done that at all the levels i feel like at this point minus like the tour de france and uh yeah i don't know that's my that's my take on it awesome 
Let's get granular on a couple of questions. I don't want to keep you here forever. This is due to dropping phenomenal knowledge. We really appreciate this. Um, what do you think's had uh, maybe a small thing that has had a big impact on training? You've kind of already dropped a bunch of these, but I figure I'll ask the question directly as well because maybe there's something else that pops out when I say that. I think, I think one thing, I, I'm always someone who's wanting to push like the limit. So mm-hmm. I'll try and keep going, keep going, keep going. And even to this day, like last week, I had to like take nine days off because, or I, I rode like only nine hours, sorry, mm-hmm. which is not much at all for me. Mm-hmm. And I was like panicked. I was like, oh, I'm not training. And then came back because I was doing some stuff with the team in LA. And I came back and I was like, yeah, I feel like the Zwift race. I was like, on Monday, the Premier League, I was like, awesome. And I was like, huh, maybe I needed some rest. <laughs> Number one, is rest and especially now that i have a baby so my total life is just like my old life style of how i would do it is in complete shambles Mm -hmm. so like i have to remember that i'm not getting the same recovery Mm -hmm. and i have to be okay with like you know what today is not the day to push Mm -hmm. and i think that that's the number one thing that i still have to teach myself i'm not saying i do this but it's like yeah i mean it's the one thing that i should listen to is like you don't have to push every day you have yeah. to listen to your body and be like, you know what? I'm not feeling it today. And that's, that's okay. Just like, take it easy, take it off. Like, I think that's the main thing I would say. That is a great tip because a lot of people that, especially they're new and they have like a training plan, which they look at as if it's the Bible, if yeah. their body's not feeling it, that workout session has now become a failure. And then it turns them into a spiral of like negative thoughts and mm-hmm. just not, not the road you want to go down. You brought up being a new dad. Congrats again on that. What, how do you find a balance? What new thing have you had to shift? Obviously maybe time or just scheduling more with your partner of like, who's doing what, or what, what's kind of a dad tip you can throw out there for people? Yeah. My wife's a nurse. So she works three, three twelves at okay. night and she just went back. So it was all good actually, honestly, until till like the last two weeks <laughs> so i can't give too much advice because i'm still trying to figure it out at this point. <laughs> Fair enough. um but i mean i just have to i have to relax with it because it's just like i know that i'm training enough mm-hmm. and it's just like you know if you don't if you don't if you don't have a good night's sleep like that's fine don't try and go out and do five hours as hard as you can the next day and then be mad at yourself that you couldn't do five hours like yeah, yeah no, no kidding like um and yeah, like just time management. I mean, like I, we just have to plan out, okay, I'm doing big days this day and this day and this day. And, you know, I can't ride as much on these two days. And, and uh, luckily when I, I mean, I've kind of already been slowly progressing to learning how to do things like that, like managing my time better, because as a pro, I was terrible at time management. I don't know what I did with every day. And then I went to EMT school and then was going to normal school and working and still riding. And I was like, wow, I really did nothing with my life for about six years. <laughs> um, and then that honestly prepared me a ton for being a dad because now, well, it's another big adjustment, but I'm already so used to like doing multiple things in a day, which the average person can, it's probably way better at than me, but that's something that I've had to learn in the last you know, a year or two. It's just mm-hmm. how to how to do multiple things at the same time. That's good. There was a guy I knew that had was having his third kid, and he's like, you know what? Every kid before, I was like, oh my god, I'm not gonna be able to train. And he goes, and somehow the hours still happen, and I just figured it out, and we worked out a system. So I'm sure you'll find the same way uh, through all that. If uh, I brought up the topic of mindset no pun intended, what comes to mind? I need to figure out a better way of saying that. Um, mm-hmm. Do you have a does it mean anything to you? Is it important to you? Um, maybe in terms, not so much in training, but maybe getting ready for a race. Yeah. And maybe thinking back, cause you've done this so long where it's been your job that it might have shifted into like second nature. But a lot of these people who are going to race who might race 10 times in a season, race day is a big day. But okay. So there, there's the thing that you just said was, it was my job and I made it that, mm-hmm. and that made me terrible. I, I took it, I cared too much and I forgot how to enjoy the fact that I actually liked racing. Mm. Um, I started, I like really didn't like racing. I was like, kind of stressed about racing. I was like, oh man, I better do good here. Yeah. And 
I forgot that I was like, no, nah, this is like a choice. Like, and especially for someone who's yeah. not their job, like you should absolutely be happy to be there. Right. Like, uh, it should not be this thing that feels like a task because like, what are you doing? Uh, it should not, this is not <laughs> definitely should not be a task. Like, well, I think um, back of it of like, when I was, I, you know, when I was trying to upgrade, whenever I was like, okay, I got to get this many points at this race. And there's, cause this is a 50 person field. So if I could win, I could get 10 points. Da, da. Whenever I was doing these calculations and like you're saying, stressing myself out, I'd come in 10th, 11th, whatever. I'd go to a bigger race where I had no expectations because there's faster people and you have quote unquote, the race of your life so far. And it's like, how did that happen? Like, cause you just it, yeah. weren't overthinking it. That was what happened to me at Roubaix. Okay. I, my goal at Roubaix was to finish. <laughs> yeah. Incredible, I was like, oh dude. man, I just want to get to the velodrome. That'd be sweet. Because, and I just like, I I found that if I didn't think about it, I was better. Yeah. Because I would overthink it. I would over, I would overstress. Oh man, I better be here at this point. Like that stuff should all just come, like almost second nature. Instead of instead of being like you, you end up thinking about it so much, and then when it comes time to actually execute, you've spent too much energy thinking about it, or you've mm. been thinking about it too much. It's already too late. Mm -hmm. um or you've been i've had people that will think about it the wrong way they'll think of it negatively they're already thinking of who's stronger and better than them and i'm like yeah which i'm you, guilty of 100 percent. if you haven't that, convinced yourself true. that you at least have a shot when it gets hard you're going to be dropped because you've already yeah. told your brain those guys are faster than you yeah so i think that i mean the the process and the mindset needs to be like all right i'm here i'm ready like i'm gonna have fun and I'm going to do what I need to do to win. And, and that's, that's kind of where you can have your idea of like, okay, well, you shouldn't in the back of your mind, like, okay, well, the race is going to happen in this section and this is what I need to do, but it can't be like this big negative thing that's going on in your head for like four days mm -hmm. out. Like it's just, that's, uh, that's something that I was really, really bad about doing to myself. Basically, my whole career was making it a job and being stressed out about whatever race it was and, and never enjoying the fact that I was like doing these awesome races or just like getting paid to be there. Mm -hmm. Like that was awesome. And that was something I had to I had to relearn when I came home. That's when I came back and was doing like just the amateur races. And I was like, man, this is fun. Like I enjoy this. And then I got way better. Do you think you were learning more when you came back and had less stress? Cause then you're just like your whole way of approaching the sport and the activity that you were engaging in was different and more like, I'm just going to go do this. And maybe you were able to take in and process more. And like, were you growing more? You felt like at that point in time or like as a person, I was growing a lot more as a writer. Can't say that I learned too much because I was able to rely a lot on my strength still. Okay. And, and the fact was like, I mean, I was coming off of being professional for how many years. So you can't like, right it feels like a little bit cheating like i'm most of the people i'm racing even in cat one feel i'll have like week-long jobs yeah like so it's just like it's not quite the same um but that's something that people who have week-long jobs need to understand too it's like you can't expect to to beat somebody like you cannot expect yourself you can beat somebody because i've definitely lost but you cannot expect to, to beat somebody who's like doing this for their job like mm -hmm. it is their job to be good at bikes mm -hmm. um and so and it's hard when you i mean i when i was working on the ambulance especially man it was really difficult to like then go on the weekend to perform yeah guy was just texting me who's in emt school i believe and he's doing a 12-hour shift on, i think he called like on the truck or whatever and then he's got school and working and ha i don't know if he has kids. And I was like, dude, like you got a lot going on. Do not put pressure on yourself. Like that's an insane plate to then be like, Oh, I'm gonna go crush these VO two max intervals. It's like, yeah, that VO two max should be like a, if anything, you should be using it as like a release of stress. And I mean, it's, it's hard. It's hard to, to, um, yeah, just like manage all of those things. And especially when that's like the cat one level, there's still a big gap in, and how much time people are able to put into it. But I would say the one thing I did learn, kind of going back to your question, was like I had to relearn how to win a race. Ah, okay. Because 
I had spent a lot of time just hanging on for dear life. Sure. For the years before that. So I had definitely had to relearn how to, to win. And again, like that, that process was aided because I was just kind of strong. Um, but again, like I had to, okay, this is the move I need to make at this time and figure it out. And unfortunately, I didn't get that much time of really getting to do that before coronavirus hit and shut it down again. So I still have a lot of learning to do in the next year or two, hopefully. So do you think that was more a mental standpoint of like when to, are you saying like when I'm launching this attack or when I'm strongest, or was it working on race winning type moves physically? Or what do you think honed that relearning how to win? You, it's different. It's, it's one thing to like race race the race and it's another thing to like race the final of the race and i think that um learning how to race the final like how much that should hurt mm. because normally if you're just doing your job for your team leader you do it till it hurts real bad and then you just pull over right? see it see it, the trailer or whatever you know mm-hmm. like it's done uh and i just finish the race and <clears throat> or you know you'd go in the breakaway that was kind of like one thing i did a lot when i was pro is i would uh, I enjoyed going in breakaways because I actually got to do something. Um, so I'd just like ride around, just like hang on. Yeah. Uh, so I'd go in the breakaway, but then it's just like go ride hard and then you get caught eventually. And then, all right, like see you guys later. Mm-hmm. Um, to actually like le- remember like, okay, this is how, this is how it feels when it's at the end of the race and not to panic and like use your, use your energy correctly at the right time. And and just not override it and stuff like that. Like uh, that was, that's something that I still, I'm sure have a lot of practice to do just because I- So like energy expenditure, when to light the last match, like- yeah. when to use your power up on Zwift. I mean, like, exactly. I messed that up on Monday, like <laughs> the Premier League race. I totally panicked and used it like about 10 seconds early. And it's just like, well, I hadn't been in the front of a Premier League race yet. So I was like, oh man, I'm, I'm here. I'm here. And, I hit it and I was like, oh damn, I should not have hit I love that. Yeah. I got two two last questions for you. I'll let you go. Um, any race routine things that you find super beneficial, whether it be something pre-race, something the way you approach a race, could be days before, could be ten minutes before. I so my fa- my one routine thing that I try my best to get every day is is my breakfast. Hmm. So not, not even that I have the same thing for breakfast, but mm-hmm. I like to have my time. I like to have a lot of coffee. I like to define a lot. Like I have like a liter French press every morning. Ooh. So okay. like I drink a fair amount of coffee. Yeah. And I just like to have like that time to just like relax and kind of like go through that that motion every day. And I try to keep that the same. If it's every day, I try to keep that the same on race day. So even if I have to wake up at a stupid time <clears throat> to do a race, I'll wake up earlier. Yeah. To make sure, like, the Zwift Worlds was, like, a stupid early time here in, in America. It was, like, or in the West Coast. It was, like, I think the race started at 6 a.m. or something. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you had to be on it at 5. So, that means I had, to, like, I woke up at, like, 4, 4, 3.30 or something just because I wanted to have a normal routine in the morning. Yeah. Um, so, that's something that I like to do. I don't like to be rushed before the race or after the race. Or I like to have my time. So, that's, that like, was- my yeah johnny purvis did the same thing he's like get to a race early he's like it just it eliminates a lot of problems Mm -hmm. as if you roll up all right the last one this is kind of very open-ended but if you were like teaching a class to a bunch of cat four fives becoming a new cyclist how to get better what would maybe be some like standout pillars of something you wanted to get across to them whether it be as general as like don't worry about intervals, just ride your bike or how you approach things. Like it kind of relates back to like just your process as a cyclist. Like how do you think about getting better in the sport? And it's, you're, you know, you kind of, it's tough to ask you this cause you've been so you've been through so many aspects of it, but maybe if you thought back to like things that would have been beneficial to hear when you were 18, 17, anything come to mind? Yeah, I think one thing is there's going to be a, there's a lot of people who want to give their advice that mm. don't necessarily, they should not necessarily be giving advice. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you're just going to get constant information thrown at you from mm. everyone who just wants to well-intended share their knowledge, but maybe you're just going to hear a million different ways of doing something. 
And I think that the one thing that's important is to keep, find who you want to put your faith in as far as listening to, you know, X amount of people, keep that circle pretty small because otherwise you just end up with information overload and, you know, decipher for yourself out of those small people, what stuff that you feel you can do because it's not, it may all work, but what work is going to, what can you do with that information? If you can like, I mean, whether it comes to diet or training or your bikes or your bike setup, like everyone like wants to look at your bike and be like, oh, you need to raise your seat and lower your stem <laughs> and this and that. Like, that's one thing I always, your position is weird. Like, all right, man, well, my body is like physiologically adapted to pedaling this way. So like, you know, sorry. Yeah. Uh, people always want to just give advice and, and you just can't listen to everybody. And and I think if you do, then you're just ended up going in like 18 different directions halfway. Mm-hmm. And that's a good way to get really slow. That's this is that's a great closing point because I've always Frank Overton was just on and he said, you know, find the thing that you literally find this, commit to it. And we were talking of like, you know, somebody's doing a polarized plan and they learn they got to do sweet spot and somebody's doing over unders and then their guy next door is doing this. And it's just like go with one thing. Did it work? Did you get faster? Can you, how do you pivot from there? How does it apply to your race? Like, how does it apply to you as the athlete? They'll all work. I bet, you know, they'll all work to some extent. It's what's like, I think it's what's most sustainable. What do you enjoy doing the most? What kind of training do you like doing the most? Because if you're motivated to train, then you'll train and that's going to make you faster. If you don't like, if you don't like riding around it, you know, zone one all day, or zone two all day, then you shouldn't do that. You should do that polarized training where it's really hard or really easy. Mm-hmm. If you, you know, like, I think that you have to learn what you can do. That way it's a sustainable thing for you because that's you, what gets you faster. And you said it before, I'm sure that you can be consistent. Yes, dude. Awesome. Hey man, how do people uh, get in touch with you? You've got, you've got a podcast, don't you? You've been, I was looking through your Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've been doing, uh, how do people follow you? I've been so bad about doing the podcast with TJ Eisenhart. Um, because yeah, I've been a little bit slammed with the baby, but, um, we do do the podcast. It's, uh, at the next stage two on Instagram. Cool. So you can find out when we, he's had some pretty cool guests on recently that I missed. He had like David Miller awesome. and he had, uh, Rick Zobel and then Rowan Dennis. So we've had like some really cool guests. On cool. There. Um, there's this cool Sep Cuss uh, podcast that was done early on with him. So that's my podcast. And then I'm on Instagram at, at TW Cycling and on Twitter that's at Tyler W Cycling. So yeah, those are the like, kind of the three ways to follow what I'm doing. Awesome, man. Well, dude, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. This is going to be a ton of, I keep saying, I hate the term gems. I think that like a ton of lessons or I really want to reframe when people are like, I caught an L. It's like, dude, you caught a lesson. So maybe thank you for dropping these L's on people. And uh, ho- hopefully we cross paths on the bike at some point and yeah. uh, wish you the best of luck with the Zwift, the in real life racing and everything you guys are doing with Legion. Absolutely. Well, thanks for having me. I, yeah. I enjoy dropping all my rants on everybody. <laughs> It's great. Good tangents, by the way. Yeah, cool. All right. Thanks, Tyler. I'll see you, man.